Good afternoon. It's Wednesday, the 28th of August 2019, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. Your host today, Mike Robinson, myself, Brian Gerrish. Back to school then? Uh, I think so. I think it is. Back to school. Yes. Well, let's see what the school boys have been up to. Uh, here is Boris, and uh, he has decided to prorogue Parliament, uh, as uh, was expected. Uh, it is interesting that, that he's done this. Uh, he's claiming that he wants to set out a new legislative agenda, uh, and so he needs a new Queen's speech for that. Um, well, of course, there hasn't been a Queen's speech since, uh, what was it, June or July 2017, when the Queen wore a blue hat with yellow dots on it. Uh, quite EU-like and, and rather than the crown. Well, so there's a question yeah. about whether this parliament was uh, was j uh, valid or not anyway. But anyway, he's decided to prorogue parliament. He's asked the Queen to, to uh, suspend parliament. Uh, and uh, so that would happen, I think, on the 10th of September. So they'd be back for a couple of days. Then they'd be off again until the 10th of uh, November of uh, October, sorry, sorry, the 14th of October, um, where he's going to outline a very exciting agenda. Uh, and this is what he had to say. Uh, we need new legislation. We've got to br be bringing forward new and important bills. And that's why we're going to have a Queen's speech. And as I say, there hasn't been a Queen's, Queen's speech uh, since July 2017, June 2017. Uh, can't remember which. Uh, but the point is that uh, this is the first time in history that any sitting of parliament has lasted more than two years. Um, so it was time for a, uh, a Queen's speech. Nonetheless, uh, it has resulted in quite a bit of outrage from the usual suspect. So uh, John Burko calling it a constitutional outrage. Uh, he said, however, uh, it's dressed up. It's blindingly obvious that the purpose of suspending parliament now would be to stop MPs debating Brexit and performing its duty in shaping the course of the country. Uh, Dominic Grieve, uh, the Tory Remain, uh, the main Tory Remainer has said uh, it's an outrageous act. This government will come down. Um, so, uh, of course, this uh, Boris Johnson had said that he wanted to, to, to wait until after Brexit before getting on with plans for moving the country forward. We need new legislation. They have to have a Queen's speech and so on. Uh, but uh, this resulted in the Germans getting quite excited. Uh, Take back control, said Francisca Branter. Uh, so this is what democracy a la Boris Johnson looks like. Uh, Marco uh, Bushman said, hard to believe that Boris Johnson wants to remove the parliament of one of the oldest democracies. First, the announcement of no deal Brexit. Now the attempt to end the long histo history of parliamentarianism in Great Britain. A pile of shards is, of, is on the horizon. Of course, this is uh, a load of rhetorical nonsense, uh, Brian, and, and really... Uh, you know, the, the, the concern from the EU side, from the Germans in particular, is because he's effectively calling the EU's bluff here. Uh, he's make, drawing a line in the sand. He's demonstrating that he's, uh, to them at least, that uh, he uh, wants to press ahead, no deal or not. So he's trying to get them to move on the only problem that he has, which is the backstop. Um, because he has already said, of course, that if the backstop was moved out of the divorce deal into the future relationship, then Theresa May's divorce deal as it stands, with the exception of, of the backstop, could probably get through Parliament. That's what he's aiming for here. Um, so over the weekend, of course, uh, we had uh, this lot uh, meeting up, uh, Labour, uh, Lib Dems, SNP and others uh, getting together um, to uh, discuss what they were going to do. Um, should the uh, the possibility of shutting down Parliament take place, they were calling it an undemocratic outrage uh, at such a cru crucial moment for our country and a historic constitutional crisis. They're talking about holding uh, an alternative Parliament. Uh, and of course, they met at Church House. And this is symbolic because Church House is where Parliament was moved to during the Second World War. Um, so uh, this they signed a, a Church House declaration uh, and uh, uh, they're apparently going to try and, and host a parliament uh, without the government. Good luck to them with that. Uh, in the meantime, however, we do have uh, the Brexit party. And here's Nigel Farage uh, tweeting out this morning. The government's announcement today makes confidence motion now certain, a general election more likely, uh, and is seen as a positive move by Brexiteers. Uh, the unanswered question is whether Boris Johnson intends to pursue the withdrawal agreement. Well, of course, he does intend to pursue that. Uh, with the caveat of the backstop, as we've just discussed. Um, so Farage then went on to say, 
Uh, if he does, then the Brexit party will fight him every inch of the way. Uh, but if he now wants a clean break Brexit, then we would like to help him secure a large majority in a general election. Now, of course, if Farage carries forward on that threat, uh, and uh, is determined to put candidates up in every seat, as he said he is, uh, then the likely outcome of that would be to divide the Brexit vote. Uh, and what would we end up with then? Uh, a majority remain parliament? Well, key part of the agenda, Mike, is, is um, chaos, isn't it? Whichever way you look, um, deceive the public, people unsure what's happening. And uh, I come back to those uh, remarks by... Danny Kruger and Nick Bowles about five years ago where they said the Tories plan to introduce chaos um, into their politics and you can see that unfolding absolutely people simply do know do not know what's happening and uh, I was just having a look through some of the uh, uh, press reports for the August period because we've been away for a couple of weeks this one caught my eye, so it's the Belf Bel Belfast Telegraph, but actually all they're doing is pushing forward a CNN uh, story. Boris Johnson could be the last Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Now, we did mention that before we came away for the holiday pe period. Um, Pre-programming the public mindset that we're going to break up the UK. So this article... Uh, basically saying that, well, Boris wasn't popular in Scotland, he wasn't popular in Wales, he wasn't popular in Northern Ireland. And uh, could he really unite the country or was it beyond uh, redemption? And then we have a look at um, journalists. I just happened to choose Julia Hartley Brewer here. Um, but basically, if you look at her tweet, whether they succeed or fail, we all know Brexit will happen anyway after they prove just how much they despise us voters, they won't be MPs for long, bring it on. Um, she said there, am I the only Brexiteer who's relishing the prospect of Ramona MPs uh, uniting to try and block a no deal Brexit? And to me, this just showed that the lady's completely out of touch with what's going mm. on. Um, she thinks Brexit is going to happen. We've been showing over weeks and months that, of course, the locking into the European project is getting deeper by, by the day. Um, but uh, let's have a look at comment by Dominic Sandbrook here, because this is along the same lines. He doesn't really understand what's going on. So he targets uh, Corbyn. Um, what is it that Corbyn and his rabble alliance don't understand about democracy? And he's getting very excited here. What arrogant, uh, arrant, arrogant, dangerous nonsense, uh, nonsense. Parliament is the people's parliament. We don't need another one. And by what right would a hardline Marxist such as John MacDonald, let alone a glorified student discussion group like the Lib Dems claim to convene one? So he's really hammering um, Labour here. But of course, he doesn't realise that he's falling into the trap that this complete breakdown between um, traditional um, lines of politics and by the various parts of the United Kingdom is uh, designed. And he goes on to say um, uh, that uh, the MPs have had plenty of chances to, um, uh, uh, to affect what's happened. Um, but they never accepted it's all arrogance. So this is all accident and arrogance. I just wanted to remind people that if we go back to 2012, this was a very interesting report that uh, Ed Miliband had brought in this man, Arnie Graff, to help rebuild Labour. Now, this man was a, a student of Saul Alinsky, uh, and Saul Alinsky was a man who said, well, you've got to use any means available in order to get your political objective across. And that includes, of course, includes breakdown. So um, we've got chaos building. And then um, Sandbrook also got very excited about the fact that the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, um, was putting his name forward to run a, um, uh, a meeting, an assembly, a citizens assembly at Coventry Cathedral aimed at discussing alternatives in leaving the EU. So here was the church getting embedded in politics. And when I saw this, Mike, I was fascinated because it took me back to many years ago. 
uh, Twin Towers era um, when we discovered that locally the then Bishop of Exeter was chairing these sorts of assemblies in order to put across a pro-EU position. But uh, we will just say to be fair to Mr. Welby that he's actually set out conditions as to, as to um, what he would need to be in place to do this. So this is what he said. Uh, I'm honoured to be approached and would be willing to accept in principle subject to some conditions which have not yet been met. met. The main three are first and indispensably that the forum should not be a Trojan horse intended to delay or prevent Brexit in any particular form. That power can only be exercised by the government and MPs in a parliament. A forum must be open to all possibilities. Second, it has cross-party support, although its members will not be politicians. Third, the, the process must have time to be properly organised. So we've got a new form of, um, of democracy coming in here, participatory democracy. One minute is the charities and the, the non-government organisations. Uh, that can have the say. Now we're bringing the church on board as a political tool. Well, absolutely. And of course, if you look back at what the UK column has been reporting for many years now, uh, at the, look at uh, the One World Governance series of articles by Martin Edwards on the website, uh, look at the Global Parliament of Mayors uh, and this type of operation, the city's agenda we've been covering quite heavily. Yeah. Uh, and then something which, uh, as Ian Crane uh, pointed out to me earlier today uh, when I was speaking to him, uh, something that he pointed out to me is something that most people have missed with respect to Extinction Rebellion is that they are absolutely campaigning for citizens, citizens assembly to like take this. over uh, from Parliament and in yeah. fact they're involved uh, with an organisation which is aiming to replace the House of Lords with the yeah. Citizens so, Assembly. So Parliament, House of Lords deliberately collapse but don't worry because we've got the solution right. here. Right, exactly yeah. that, yes. Okay, uh, Let's move on to this then. So uh, hashtag 100 ways aid works. This is the new government hashtag, uh, all about uh, international aid. Uh, and this is apparently, according to uh, the International Development Secretary, Alok Sharma, this is all about developing infrastructure in uh, uh, emerging uh, countries and emerging markets. Uh, so he has decided to set up a new commission, which is going to bring together leading experts to turbocharge quality infrastructure projects in developing countries. Uh, the commission is going to be made up of UK and international business leaders, common purpose, uh, bringing the very best of British expertise and will make recommendations to improve the planning, delivery and financing of infrastructure projects. Um, well, so why doesn't Britain just join the Belt and Road then? Because surely that's what that's doing. That seems to be quite successful at building infrastructure projects uh, in developing countries at the moment. But no, that's the wrong type of infrastructure project because this is what this is all about is the UN Global Goals uh, and the $2.5 trillion funding gap uh, that there is to fulfill the Global Goals. Uh, and so this commission, uh, which is being established, is going to uh, make sure that the, the UK uh, gets involved in financing and developing infrastructure uh, and promotes inclusive growth while meeting the pa Paris climate commitments. Uh, so that's what it's all about. Um, and uh, so he said an extra $2.5 trillion is needed every year to end poverty in developing countries and the UK must mobilise private sector investment to overcome this challenge. Uh, alongside the life-saving work of UK aid, uh, we need to boost infrastructure projects that form the backbone of economic growth. That's fantastic stuff. Uh, well, in the meantime, then, the G7 has been going on. Uh, and, uh, well, let's just have a brief look at uh, some of the headlines uh, from the media on this. Uh, this is The Guardian. We need to cancel the next G7. Let's resume them when Trump is gone. Uh, we've got uh, Business Insider, Trump's G7 performance shows how he's living in a totally different reality and isolating the US from the rest of the world. Uh, and The Guardian again, uh, Biritz was an empty charade. The G7 is a relic of a bygone age. And what are the sort of views that are being expressed in these articles? Really, Trump is a problem. Uh, the G7 is not equipped to work towards its goals. And the biggest obstacle is the US President Donald Trump. This is one of the Guardian articles. The goal of the G7 is to bring together some of the world's most prosperous democracies to coordinate on the most important issues of the day, whether on climate change, 
uh, or responding to Russia's invasion of Crimea or making gender equality a reality. The G7 countries are supposed to lead crafting policies that can foster global peace and prosperity in ways that uphold democratic values. And if everybody <laughs> has managed not to throw up in the nearest bin over that, uh, it then goes on to say that uh, Trump wants America to work alone to destroy the current global trading system slash foreign assistance that helps address transnational challenges, ignore human rights, and doesn't believe climate change is real. Uh, the G7 is an annual long weekend of toddler daycare for Trump is the language that's being used. It's really well, spectacular They obviously don't stuff. like him. No, clearly not. But in the meantime then, uh, the other focus was all about Emmanuel Macron, how, what a brilliant global leader he is. And of course he was leading the way to agree to help Brazil fight the Amazon fires. Uh, this is, you know, the fact that, that the Amazon allegedly is, is burning and we've all got to get together globally uh, and uh, intervene in, in uh, Brazil. Um, so uh, that was uh, the real times there. G7 agrees to help Brazil fight Amazon fires, says French President Macron. Well, Brazil didn't like that very much. They've rejected the $22 million aid package. Uh, and this is really what it's about. Uh, Bolsonaro saying other heads of state sympathized with Brazil. After all, respect for the sovereignty of any country is the least that can be expected, expected in a civilized world. So really what the, he's complaining about is that the G7 was attempting to ride roughshod over his decisions about what, how he was gonna deal with this problem. Um, and he went on to say this, uh, thanks uh, to Donald Trump, uh, we're having a great success in fighting the fires. Brazil is and will continue to be an example of the world and sustainable development. The fake news campaign fabricated against our sovereignty will not thrive. The US can always count on Brazil. So he's saying it is an attack on him, on his government and so on. And so the question that, uh, that uh, I wanted to ask was, you know, what is the situation uh, with these fires? Uh, and in fact, if we uh, look at uh, NASA's Earth Observatory website and their section on the fires in Brazil, it says, uh, uh, in the Amazon rainforest, fire season has arrived. In the Amazon region, fires are rare for much of the year because wet weather prevents them from starting and spreading. However, in July and August, activity typically increases due to the arrival of the dry season. Many people use fire to maintain farmland and pastures and to clear land for other purposes. Typically, activity peaks in early September and mostly stops by November. Uh, as of August 16, 2019, an analysis of NASA satellite data indicated the total fire activity across the Amazon basin this year has been close to the average in comparison in the last 15 years. Now, anybody looking at the uh, mainstream media coverage of this would think that the entire Amazon rainforest is burning down. But NASA here quite clearly saying that uh, the fires, the level of fires at the moment, about the average of the last 15 years. Uh, they say the Amazon spreads across Brazil, Peru, Colombia and parts of other countries. And they say that though activity appears to be above average in the states of Amazonas, uh, Amazonas and uh, Rondi, uh, Ron, R sorry, Rondonia, uh, it's so far appeared below average in Mato Grosso and Para, uh, according to estimates of from the Global Fire uh, Emissions Database, which is a research project that compiles and analyzes NASA data. Uh, and then we have uh, this in Forbes, which is attempting to put a bit more uh, clarity on the situation and I recommend this article because it's actually quite detailed uh, and uh, the, 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 what's interesting is that the, the main expert that they're talking to is uh, somebody from the International uh, Panel of Climate Change, so the, the United Nations IPCC and what he's saying, uh, well first of all he's talking about the claim that uh, the Amazon is the lungs of the world uh, and he said this is his language, it's bullshit. Uh, there's no science behind that. The Amazon produces a lot of oxygen, but it uses the same amount of oxygen through respiration. So it's a wash. Uh, and the article goes on to say, neither is the Amazon forest burning down, IPCC. So, th so this is Daniel uh, Nepstad, is the uh, environmentalist uh, that uh, they have gone to. And he said, we don't know if there are any more forest fires this year than in past years, which tells me there probably aren't. Uh, uh, I've been working on studying these fires for 25 years and our on the ground networks are tracking this. So he's quite clear about that uh, and about the, the sort of claims that are being made about the, uh, the whole thing. 
Um, and it is clearly an attack on the sovereignty of uh, Brazil. Yeah, but good to see that actually somebody is paying attention, even though you might point a finger at them and say they're in the system. They are not so in the system. They can't see that, that what's being said is wrong. Uh, absolutely, but, it's, but this, is, this is mainly coming from the mainstream media, uh, being pumped by the NGOs, the usual NGOs that are pushing forward this uh, this green agenda at the moment, and that, and not just NGOs, uh, British and European governments as well. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, some people uh, in NASA and the IPCC sort of saying, "Hold on a second, this is getting a bit out of hand." Yeah. Um, okay. A quick reminder: if you like what uh, the UK Column is doing and you'd like to support us, then please head over to ukcolumn.org/community, uh, and there are various options to join us uh, there. Um, now, tomorrow evening, uh, we will have uh, Humanity versus Insanity. Uh, Ian Crane will be in the studio. He will have Dr. Graham Downing as a guest. Um, and they're going to be uh, looking at the uh, massive attack on uh, free speech with respect to vaccinations, for example, uh, and the emergence of the new v measles vaccine, uh, sorry, virus, uh, which seems to have come out of uh, the Ukraine, um, and uh, so they'll be talking about that. They'll also be talking about uh, a little bit of what we've been discussing, uh, Brian, with respect to the breakdown of uh, parliamentary sovereignty and uh, uh, you know this, State this of the move, country. Th well, this move towards uh, uh, citizens' assemblies and so on. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, quick update on um, Lynn Thayer. If you remember, that Lynn was extradited to France ch with charges. Uh, concerning GC Math, these were essentially charges that had been levied against David Noakes, but had simply been uh, transferred across to Lynn. Um, we now know that she she um, is in a prison in one of the French districts. On screen is her full address, complete with her uh, prisoner number. So the prison is Fleury Morogis, and uh, the address there is on screen. I'll just read it out quickly for those that are just listening. Thaya Linda, number 452710-3R08, MAF de Fleury Morogis, 9 Avenue de Pouplier, P-E-U-P-L-I-E-R-S, 91705, Saint Genevieve de Bois, France. So we can't tell you much more than that. Um, Lynn is actually waiting to see a judge who we believe is on holiday until mid-September. Um, but at the moment, everything appears to be on rails to put her through the system. You can write to her. She has not been able to reply to most, maybe all letters that she has received, but we know that she's got a big boost from getting a letter. So if you can write or send her a card, it would make a big difference to her. Um, and a quick reminder uh, of the GCMAF uh, awareness event, which is taking place at 11 minutes past 11 on the 11th of September. That'll be outside Parliament. I'm not sure yet uh, what this uh, proroguing of Parliament is going to do to that. I presume it's going to go ahead in any case. Uh, it's a bit unfortunate, the timing, but nonetheless, uh, that uh, we'll keep you updated on that uh, as we get more details. Now, um, Opium, oh, not opium, but opioids. Um, this Johnson Johnson have uh, been fined five hundred million dollars. Uh, they're going to appeal this fine. They're calling it a flawed judgment. But basically, uh, you know, this is mainly about uh, opioid addiction in the United States. Now, in the UK, uh, various media outlets finally catching on to the fact that this is becoming a problem here as well. So this is DW, Deutsche Welle, which is a uh, German outlet saying opioid addiction in Britain has spiralled to a dangerous level. Experts warn that the UK is approaching a crisis of US proportions uh, and they're asking what the government's going to do about it. So uh, th they're citing uh, Department of Health statistics uh, that they're saying that the number of prescriptions in England and Wales issued uh, for opioid uh, medicines has risen from 14 million in 2008 to 23 million last year. Uh, 113,000 opioid prescriptions are now dispensed by general practitioners every day in the United Kingdom. And we know that Scotland is currently the worst region of the UK for that. 
So uh, Britain is in danger of replicating the UK opioid crisis, they say. Uh, there is some fairly strong anecdotal evidence that people are taking these pills not just for pain, but to really to take the rough edges off a fairly crap life. Uh, and, and that was a, 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 a quote from a, a somebody that's familiar with uh, the situation. So Johnson & Johnson been ordered to pay $572 million for their point, part in the uh, U.S., uh, the situation in the state of Oklahoma in the United States. Um, their share price went up on the news uh, and it's hardly surprising because unfortunately this court case hasn't quite gone to plan in, in the sense that uh, the judge found that the state did not present sufficient evidence of the amount of time and costs necessary beyond year one to abate the opioid crisis. So basically this payout of $500 million only reflects one year's worth of estimated abatement costs, which is what they were. So they were actually, if, if the prosecution had done their job right, were in for quite a significant uh, fine. Right. Uh, but this is being viewed as just a slap on the wrist and therefore the share price went up. Johnson & Johnson are saying they're going to appeal uh, and they're saying that the, uh, the, the, situ the, the decision was flawed. But coming back to the UK once again, I just want to remind everybody that if we go back to uh, the Salisbury incident, the so-called Skripal affair, the original report here, uh, it followed an incident hours earlier in which a man and a woman were exposed to the drug fentanyl in the city centre. So this was the initial reports over the Salisbury uh, uh, incident. And, you know, no matter what you think about this report, the fact it was it was subsequently changed to say Novichok, but the initial uh, assumption was that it was fentanyl and that yeah. uh, really reflects uh, the reality of what's going on in the UK at the moment because of course people get started off on prescription opioids and end up on heroin and, and fentanyl uh, and uh, this is really what's causing the, the significant deaths in the United States and this is uh, happening here already. It's only starting to hit the mainstream news. But the profits rolling in for, for big pharma. Uh, well, thank you very much to the viewer who uh, to the viewer who sent uh, sent me this article. Um, heavy subject: euthanasia in Holland, and the headline is "Held Down and Killed." Dutch case reveals the horror of euthanasia, and uh, this is a particularly nasty little story of a lady who realised that she had dementia. She did actually make a statement at one stage that if it got really bad, she wouldn't want to live through it. Um, but what happened was that she got to a particular point where her family and a doctor um, decided that she'd got to the end. Um, so there were sedatives put in one of her drinks, um, but it didn't knock her out. And she uh, effectively came to to discover the, the family were disposing of her and the doctor in charge and now faces charges over that, although the article is saying that even if found guilty, she, the doctor, will not face any prison time. But here is an elderly person who is suffering from dementia, but at a critical time has enough um, common sense about them to realise that something deeply unpleasant is happening. Uh, we just like to remind people that, of course, it was David Cameron a few years ago who pointed out uh, that uh, millions of people were expected to have dementia in the uh, UK. There was no discussion as to where the dementia had come from, but uh, millions of people, I think two million was the figure actually that David Cameron mentioned, uh, were going to have dementia and the government needed to deal with this. Uh, well, this is um, one of the little headlines that again we were sent. David Cameron joins Alzheimer's Research UK as our president to continue a mission he instigated through the Prime Minister's Dementia Challenge. Now, that's a report from the 25th of January 2017. Um, this was uh, a headline, a uh, recent headline. David Cameron's venture capital fund invests 6.5 million in search for the first dementia drugs. So more business for the big pharmaceuticals, Mike. Is that drugs to create dementia? Um, well, one, <laughs> they get profit both ways because of course we know that elderly people are being given sedatives in uh, residential and care homes which produce dementia-like symptoms where a 
presumably the drug companies can then give them more drugs to try and cure the symptoms they've created in the first place but it says the dementia discovery fund is the world's largest investment fund focused on a single medical research area its backers who've invested 290 million include bill gates the uk government and seven top pharmaceutical firms including gsk and pfizer so there you are rest assured that uh, david cameron has got your best interests at heart and he'll be thinking of you as you're lying on your bed in the care home um, but uh, this was an interesting one also sent through to us so it's sell to wales um, this is an official website where contract details are notified and uh, we've got here for the computerized cognitive behavior therapy software is uh, what they're talking about and um, some small print here we'll see what we could do here it says the Scottish government has recognized changes this is to do with a massive increase of people um, with depression stress and uh, anxiety coming forward in Scotland the number of individuals prescribed antidepressants has doubled in five years with the demand for specialist face-to-face -face psychological therapy doubling in the past 10 years the Scottish government has recognized these changes through its 2020 vision which states the need to underpin service redesign with the use of quote digital health whilst enabling patients to self-manage their own conditions you like the sound of this Mike yeah. uh, in 2017-18 a full national rollout of the computerized cognitive behavioral therapy service across all 14 territorial health boards was achieved offering a national solution to the increasing demand of common uh, mental health problems such as low mood depression and anxiety so uh, so is there a coincidence between that and the opioid problem in in scotland well i think there's some questions to be asked but uh, the person who sent this to me said i find this advert very very creepy and i certainly agree with them on that but we know that uh, elderly people are being induced into dementia-like symptoms um, and we know that uh, many people are suffering depression or anxiety or stress illnesses as a result of the society that the government is creating around them mm. so uh, ai is going to sort it out though uh, well possibly not we'll we'll see now here is uh <laughs> while we're away on our summer break of course people were starting to ask questions about the use of facial recognition uh, technology at king's cross in london uh, even sadiq khan the mayor of london got uh, in on the act uh, and uh, well they're all saying that this is dangerous and we've we've got to stop it uh, here is uh, here is our old friend uh, Elizabeth Denham who's the information commission commissioner uh, saying uh, uh, scanning people's faces as they lawfully go about their daily lives in order to identify them identify them is a potential threat to privacy that should concern us all uh, she said uh, we've launched an investigation following uh, concerns reported in the media regarding the use of live facial recognition in the King's Cross area of central London which thousands of people pass through every day. Um, so uh, Argent is the developer that manages the King's Cross site. Uh, but of course, uh, it's not just them that uh, Elizabeth Denham is investigating because the Metropolitan Police, uh, as, we, as we mentioned several times in this program, had been carrying out a number of trials. I think it's 10 trials in total uh, using facial recognition technolo technology across London. Um, as part of efforts they said to incorporate the latest technologies into day-to-day de -day policing um, but in May uh, the information commissioner Elizabeth Denham had said that they, she was investigating them for potentially illegal use of the technology um, and uh, unfortunately the technology also was found to not really work very well I think 81 percent of the cases it didn't work but nonetheless uh, they're still trying to roll this out as quickly as they possibly can uh, this is not uh, these concerns are not unique to the UK either so here we've got uh, the Financial Times saying that the EU plans sweeping regulation of uh, facial recognition and in the United States uh, Ohio is the latest of several states to ban the use of uh, facial recognition the use of uh, facial recognition databases uh, and uh, this is following reports of the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency had been scanning millions of uh, of state drive driving license uh, photographs 
uh, in order to look for uh, illegal immigrants and so on. Um, so uh, the, there are calls in the US for a blanket ban on the use of facial recognition technology until there's some kind of proper regulation in place there. Um, so there seems to be some pushback on this, but there's no. it's pretty clear that, that uh, the authorities are absolutely dying to get their hands on it, particularly after uh, the little exercise that the BBC ran in China a couple of years yeah. ago where, where the, the BBC uh, uh, journalist yeah. uh, was uh, found within seven minutes uh, during that little exercise. Let loose in, in, a, in a city. Uh, in yeah. a city, yeah. Yeah, so, but uh, we don't have to worry uh, because the BBC has our backs. Uh, so here we go. Hey, babe. Uh, our, your unbiased friend, it's on its way, it's on its way. Uh, the BBC is preparing to launch uh, its rival to uh, Amazon's Alexa. It's going to be called Beeb. Um, and apparently it's going to understand, uh, this is Guardian was saying that it's going to understand British accents, which is uh, something people are complaining about. That's not really what this is about. Uh, this is some lame attempt by the Guardian to sort of uh, uh, make this seem reasonable. But basically the BBC has increasingly you know, despite the fact that people are paying their TV licenses, uh, hopefully you know, not as many as, as would otherwise be, but uh, uh, some people are still paying their TV licenses, but still they've got to sign in and be tracked if they're attempting to use BBC's iPlayer service and so on. Uh, this goes for, for video products and also radio products. Uh, so the BBC becoming a, a big data mining exercise, uh, and that's pretty much what, uh, what this is about as well. I mean, can you imagine... Uh you know, you've got Alexa already, which is um, clearly listening all the time. There's no question that it's doing that. Having a, one of these things directly connected to the BBC in your home running 24 hours a day. Well, they're saying they're not going to produce the hardware initially. Initially, it's going to be software that's going to go onto your Alexa oh, well, uh, or well, onto well, your, Google, okay. your Google product. So that <laughs> makes it okay then. So it means, it means that not only is Amazon getting your data, but the BBC is getting your data as well. Uh, and uh, well, uh, are they going to be listening to people's bedroom activities uh, as as Amazon? Well, has been? anything they can, anything they, they can, can manage Hoover to up. pick up. Absolutely. Well, let's end with the subject of um, Jeffrey Epstein. Now, of course, this really came to a head about the time we did our last news earlier in the month, and um, many people have commented on how there's almost been a sigh of relief in the establishment that. Jeffrey Epstein was found dead in his cell. Um, but the story um, is continuing to drag on. Uh, here's the BBC. Jeffrey Epstein accuser urges Prince Andrew to come clean. Uh, so it's saying a woman who accused the late financier Jeffrey Epstein of sex abuse and alleged she was forced to have sex with Prince Andrew as a 17 year old has urged the UK royal to come clean. She's actually, um, she said this in writing, but she's also said it in front of cameras very recently. Uh, speaking after a hearing for alleged victims in the wake of Epstein's death, Virginia Guffrey told reporters the prince knows what he's done. The Duke of York denies the, uh, the accusation, the BBC says. And then it says Epstein killed himself in his prison cell this month while awaiting trial on sex trafficking and conspiracy charges. That was remarkably um, convenient and got rid of a lot of problems mm. for a lot of people, mm. I think. But let's uh, follow the BBC report through because um, they don't actually give the main detail about Prince Andrew. You've got to connect via web links embedded in the article. So it's very interesting to see how the BBC plays this. If you do connect on the links, it all becomes a bit explicit because here's Prince Andrew together with the young lady and um, uh, on location in, in one of Epstein's houses. And uh, of course, this is the other um, picture that, that won't go away, which is a Prince Andrew with Epstein in Central Park after Epstein had been released from prison and was therefore at that stage a, a convicted paedophile. So um, where does this go? Well, if you follow the BBC article through, who does it end with? It ends with a picture of um, Epstein alongside Trump. So there's all the charges. What was Epstein charged with? Um, that's listed quite simply. What's the last image that the BBC puts in your mind? It isn't Prince Andrew, it's mm. Trump. I thought this was a very carefully crafted article. 
Um, but um, this was uh, The Guardian's report. Uh, Prince Andrew knows what he's done, says Jeffrey Epstein, accuser. Uh, Royal has previously denied uh, Virginia Guffrey's accusation that she was forced to have sex with him. Uh, and this is what uh, Andrew said. Um, they made Epstein's acquaintance in 1999 and saw him once or maybe twice each year. Uh, the prince also said he stayed at several of his homes. Uh, he did not see, witness or suspect any behaviour of the sort that subsequently led to Epstein's arrest and conviction. So that's good. Uh, he added, I have said previously it was a mistake and an error to see him after his release from prison in 2010. And I can only reiterate my regret that I was mistaken to think that what I thought I knew of him was evidently not the real person, given what we now know. That's surprising, isn't it? Because he'd been released from prison after being found guilty of what was effectively a paedophile offence. Yeah, that's an untenable position to be taking from... I, I think this is desperation yeah. because it's, um, it's complete rubbish. The Prince also said his suicide has left many unanswered questions and I acknowledge and sympathise with everyone who's been affected and wants some form of closure. Mm. So this, of course, um, wasn't the uh, type of response that the royal family have given to the subject of child abuse. Um, but there we go. We'd like to say that actually, as far as the Prince is concerned, we remember abuse at Oxford and Sherwell Valley College. It's going back to 2011 when the UK column did a lot of work on the abuse of youngsters at that college. And we also became aware that uh, Prince Andrew was due to visit the college and we warned uh, one of his aides that uh, the college had been involved in some pretty appalling stuff with respect to the students. But Prince Andrew continued the vi visit and he went and visited one of the worst of the workshops where abuse had taken place. So he didn't seem very concerned about uh, that angle. No. No. Um, somebody took up the case though and um, they started to ask some freedom of information questions about the college and his visit and I just thought people would be interested to see that the response that a Mr Roberts uh, got uh, was effectively to say well we can't give you too much information because it concerns the royal family. I refer to your recent request concerning all letters and emails relating to the recent vis visit of Prince Andrew to the college. I would refer you to section 40 relating to personal data, 37 brackets 1, AC and AD in respect of a communication with the royal family and the royal household, which relates to endangering the safety of an individual. So if you ask questions about a royal visit to a college where the abuse of children has taken place, they can't tell you anything because it might endanger the royal family. Yes. It's brilliant. Uh, and then here we've got here a bit more 37 AC and AD are qualified exemptions and therefore subject to a public interest uh, test. But essentially the public is not going to get any information when they ask questions. And uh, we'll end on this report from the mail. Uh, we've got another, per another lady coming forward alleging abuse. British actress 42 went to school with Kate Middleton, revealed she was manipulated, coerced and sexually abused by Jeff Jeffrey Epstein as a teenager at a hearing alongside 30 of the paedophiles' victims. Uh, but embedded in the Mail article was this paragraph. Epstein's lawyers were also given a chance to speak. They suggested shockingly that he had been murdered and said his neck injuries were more consistent with a homicide than suicide. They told the judge they had hired their own experts to look into whether or not the disgraced paedophile might have been killed. Well, that was a little piece buried in the article. The mail, uh, for its credit, did put a bit more information in. Uh, they had this, official said Epstein hanged himself with a bed sheet from the top set of bunks. He was found with several broken bones in his neck, including the hyoid bone when guards were doing their morning rounds. Revelations of the broken bones in his neck lead to speculation that his death was a homicide. Breakages to that specific bone can occur when people hang themselves, but are more commonly seen in victims who've been strangled. 
according to forensic experts. So um, that didn't seem to appear in the BBC report, but the mail did get it out. Mm. Uh, but our take on it is that uh, a very convenient death of Mr Epstein. And of course, the palace uh, will now um, do their best to stay in the background and let it all disappear into the long grass. Hopefully that will not be allowed to happen. Indeed. OK, well, we will end there. Thank you very much for joining us. I'll just say in response to the questions about our holidays that we have not been off to any exotic locations because, of course, that would contribute to global warming. So, Mike, you were in Scotland mm -hmm. where the weather was OK. OK. Uh, I was in Devon where the weather was pretty good to OK. So that's it for us. Thanks very much for joining us. We'll be back at the same time on Friday. Bye-bye.